is against former President Donald Trump. A New York judge just ruled in the civil fraud case that Trump is liable of falsifying business records, conspiracy, and issuing false financial statements, among other claims. Now, Trump and the Trump Organization is now expected to repay more than $354 million. New York Attorney General Letitia James had accused the former president and his organization of overstating his net worth in order to win favorable terms on loans. In September, New York Supreme Court Judge Arthur Engoron found Trump had committed fraud for more than a decade, but had not yet ruled on six other claims that we just learned about today. CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa joins me now. Bob, does today's ruling mean, what does it mean, rather, for the former president? We know this is not a criminal case. This really affects his business dealings. Jerika, good to be with you. This is not a criminal case. It is a civil fraud case, but this penalty is sweeping in scope. Former President Donald Trump and his co-defendants in this case ordered today by Judge Arthur and Gorin to pay out more than $300 million, about $350 million in damages because he believes that the Trump Organization, led by former President Trump for many years, defrauded the state of New York. And not only is there a financial penalty as part of this ruling, a very comprehensive ruling by Angoran, we're also seeing former President Donald Trump being barred from being a director or leader of any corporation in the state of New York for the next three years. That's a directive for not only Trump, but other co-defendants in this case, including the former chief financial executive at the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg. And Donald Trump's own sons, Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr., are barred from being in an executive or leadership main position at a New York company for the next two years. Now, for some people, this kind of ruling maybe wouldn't be that dramatic. But for the Trump family, which is so intertwined with the Trump Organization, going back to Fred Trump, the former president's father, who built all of these developments in the New York City boroughs in the 1960s and 1970s, and then Trump as he developed his own properties in the 80s and 90s. The family is the business. And Trump has so much of his valuation as part of his brand, as part of his marketing value. And now he is going to likely have to find significant amount of cash to pay out this penalty. And as he pays out this penalty, he will, of course, uh, try to appeal it in the coming months, but he will also be under a cash crunch. He's facing the E. Jean Carroll civil penalty of over $80 million. He was found liable of rape in that civil case in New York. And for someone who doesn't have his whole business in cash, this is a real challenge facing him. We don't have direct details on how he's going to pay it out yet and the timeline for how he will be ordered to do so. But what's important to know here is over $300 million now could be coming out of the Trump coffers to the state of New York. And while he pays that out, he can't work as an executive in the state. All right. That's that's absolutely right. I'm joined now here with Scott McFarlane and Major Garrett. I, I want to talk to you about Donald Trump's children, because there are moments where the judge mentions them in this as well. You guys are just going through the, the documents right now. I just got them handed to me here. But as we're learning about more of the details, what more can you say about uh, the children involved in all of this. Judge is pretty emphatic about this and unequivocal, saying Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump, according to sufficient evidence, intentionally falsified business records, and the penalties extend to them, too. They are also banned now from running a corporation in the state of New York for two years. You'll also recall, during the trial, they took the stand. So did Ivanka Trump, and those are some of the most mm -hmm. powerful moments of the trial. Ivanka Trump there for hours answering questions about what her brothers, her father, and she did with this corporation. It truly was part of the spectacle that was this trial, but in the meat of this judgment is a ban on the sons from running a business and a clear statement from the judge they were intentional in their falsifications. And, Major, I want to turn to you because you've been covering all parts of mm -hmm. everything related to, to Donald Trump, and not just this case, but the sure. other ones as well. What type of impact does this have on his campaign, especially knowing just recently we learned about the March 25th mm -hmm. start of the trial? Well, he will have to be present for several weeks. Sure. So we have lots of different legal buckets where the former president is involved. You have criminal, you have civil. This is civil, but this is much larger than that. It's reputational. This strikes at the very heart of Donald Trump's larger American story. 
of being an aggressive deal maker who makes things happen and who builds fortunes for himself and for others. And what this case has always been about is, was there something illegitimate about all those representations within the Trump real estate empire? Were things valued more than they were worth? Were things misrepresented to momentarily provide financial advantage to the Trump family or the Trump organization at some harm either to the state of New York or to creditors or borrowers? And this case is really about, yes, in fact, when you look at the numbers and when you scrutinize everything that was marketed about the Trump brand and the Trump name, it didn't add up. And no case, no case on the docket in the last two years has more infuriated the former president than this one. It was personal, without a doubt. I want to turn now to political campaign reporter Katrina Kaufman. She's been following many of the former president's legal troubles. Uh, are you surprised at all by this? Obviously, Letitia James, the attorney general in New York, asking for $370 million, uh, but $354 million. And it's, it's probably assumed that Trump will appeal this. Of course he'll appeal. They've been making that clear since day one of this case, that they knew that they were going to lose and that they thought that they would win this case on appeal. Um, I can't say that I'm surprised by this ruling. It is almost what Letitia James asked for. And I was struck by a part of it where the judge talks about the lack of contrition. He says it borders on almost pathological and that the only thing that Trump would even admit was a mistake was the size of his triplex, which Trump actually did during the closing arguments when he, in court, started speaking for about five minutes, really unauthorized by the judge, and I think accidentally admitted that that was a mistake. And as far as some of what we're talking about in reference to his other legal woes, how do you think this will impact some of the other, I mean, the upcoming trial that I just mentioned starting next month, uh, only because it seems that it hasn't necessarily affected him on the campaign trail. Does this sort of start to change the tide, if you will? I think it impacts him financially. I mean, as Bob was saying, he has huge debts to pay now. He has the E. Jean Carroll trial. That's $83.3 million plus a previous $5 million. Now this is another $350 million. So it's really hurting him financially. And he hasn't done well in New York. He just lost the E. Jean Carroll trial here. He has not done well in the civil fraud verdict. And now he has the hush money trial coming up. And that is going to be the first criminal trial ever prosecuted against a former president. CBS News, uh, Rachel, thank you. Uh, CBS News legal expert and analyst Ricky Kleeman joins us now. Ricky, how does this compare to the criminal cases facing Trump right now? Well, people might think that the criminal cases are far more significant against Donald Trump because it involves, of course, the possibility of conviction and ultimately the possibility of prison time. However, I would say that I am one of the legal experts, among many others, who firmly believes that this case, above all cases, is the one that disturbs Donald Trump most of all. You have to remember that Donald Trump has felt that Judge Angoran has been prejudiced against him from the very beginning and has been very vocal about that fact, saying that the fraud was the first ruling. And so why were we even having a trial? Because the only thing left was to decide a penalty. So Donald Trump and his lawyers must have fully expected that the penalty would be mighty. The problem here, Jerika, is this. It's not so much only the brand. It's not the mix of the political and the legal for me. What it says to me is, if I am Donald Trump's lawyer, I think I have many grounds for appeal. But I've got to post money or a surety bond in order to go forward with the appeal. And in New York, that is a phenomenal amount of money, because it's either the $350 million plus interest that you would have to come up with to go forward with the appeal, or it's a surety bond. And who's going to give him a surety bond when the collateral for the bond might be properties that have to be sold? So he's in a very, very difficult position in terms of not only his finances, but in how he projects himself to the world. I think this is far more significant to him and to his attorneys than going forward at the end of March in New York with a criminal case. All right. And Ricky, we want you to stand by. I want to turn now to Scott McFarland. I know that 
you've talked about the threats, and, and it's discussed here in this document, uh, that wasn't just facing the judge, but also those who, who work around him. How impactful or what was the message there uh, in this ruling? In the courtroom for this trial, what struck me most was the ugliness of this trial. There was a gag order issued because Donald Trump was posting on social media conspiracy theories about the judge's clerk, and he persisted in doing so. Those led to some number of threats against the court staff or against the judge's office. And it begs the question, Jerika and Major, are we going to see more of that when Donald Trump returns to court in all these criminal cases that are now stacked up from New York to D.C. to Florida to Georgia? The tenor and tone of this trial were troubling to so many people, and it's not his last time in court. And it's worth pointing out that in that context that Scott just raised, the former president spends an extravagant amount of time talking about a two-tiered system of justice in this country, alleging that he is a victim of one that is harsher on him than it is on other Americans. Any other defendant who acted as former President Trump did in those social media posts would have received far more harsh a penalty than a momentary, temporary, and limited gag order. They would have probably been held in contempt of court. That was never even on the table for the former president. So in this conduct, in this space that he finds himself where there's permissible room for him to threaten or uh, create the atmosphere of threat around judicial proceedings, he is being encouraged or at least entitled to something that most other Americans would be denied and denied almost instantaneously. So you don't think this will have an impact in terms of his his decorum or how he reacts or responds? After, it, 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 may, after it might or it might not. Like well, this. we know that the record established so far is he's been given, he has been given latitude. No other defendant in this country would be. I want to turn to Robert Costa, who's standing by as well there in New York. You were also in the courtroom uh, for some of this. Uh, has Trump been using this civil trial as a campaign opportunity? It's been quite a scene, Jerika, to cover in New York over the past few months. Former President Donald Trump has not always been called to be in the courtroom. He has decided voluntarily to appear there, and he doesn't just slip in the back door. He goes in, he talks to this cascade of reporters in front of him, cameras, and he holds court almost like he's on the campaign trail, and he makes a, a mini speech oftentimes before he enters the courtroom, and sometimes he takes breaks during the course of this civil fraud trial to come outside the room and sharply, sharply criticize Judge Angoran and some members of Judge Angoran's staff to the point where there have been multiple confrontations between the judge and Trump in the courtroom about his conduct, warning Trump that he's going over the line. So there was never a question here about whether fraud took place in the eyes of Judge Angoran. This civil fraud case began with the judge stating he believed there was fraud that took place. It was always going to be about the penalty. But instead of trying to appeal to the judge, be friendly to the judge, Trump has launched not only a legal war against him, but a political war against him. And he has cast the judge as an enemy of Trump, not just someone he's fighting inside the courtroom. Okay. Uh, Robert, thank you. I want to turn back to Ricky. Uh, now that we know, and, and as uh, we pointed out earlier, it was likely to happen that he would appeal if this wasn't uh, favorable, which how could it be, knowing what we knew going into this? Um, what is next? What will be the process? How long does this sort of drag out? What can you tell us? Well, the appeal has teeth. Um, one of the things that we do know is that the Associated Press did a study of over 70 cases uh, where there was the situation of this uh, of a magnitude of fraud. And in no case was there a fraud with this magnitude of punishment, an ex extraordinary sum of dollars of punishment, where there was no victim and ultimately no damage to the victim, being the banks, according to the banks. It's not a situation where people have lost money, let alone lost lives because of a fraud. So when he goes forward through his lawyers with the appeal, assuming that he can come up with money to post for the appeal, he really does have a viable argument that this is a different justice system applying to him and to his business. And because we do not have someone who's saying, I was hurt. This was an argument raised over and over in court, and it was an argument that the judge had said that he did not accept. 
because it didn't matter under this New York 70-year-old statute that you had to have damage to a victim. So there will be a very good appeal, at least in terms of argument, on this issue alone. What happens is the appeal has to be docketed. In order, a notice of appeal is filed and is docketed, but money has to be posted in order for it to go forward. This appeal, some people say it could take a year. Some people say it could take longer. There are other people who will say, no, that the first department of the appellate division, which will be the first appellate court to look at this, has a very complete record and can act expeditiously. I am not quite so optimistic about the question of time. I think these things do take time, and these issues are complicated. And, and I, I wonder how much time, you know, you really have during an election year and the impact, I think, that that will have on people. And I'm sure, uh, you know, we, we wait to find out. No one can speculate. Um, but obviously, we've seen sort of this before. We know we've been talking about the various cases uh, that he's involved with, and, and it seems to sort of, uh, you know, his supporters and whatnot are not— taken aback by accusations, allegations, uh, and we don't know what will be the outcome, obviously, with this latest development. Uh, I want to turn to Katrina uh, and go back to you in terms of if you believe that uh, Trump is sort of being made an example of—I mean, you heard Ricky just talk about the Associated Press report and having a strong argument for not being treated uh, before like other folks, but obviously not having this kind of money that we're talking about with over $300 million. Yeah, well, another part of this opinion that stood out to me is Judge Ungoran says that New York means business in combating business fraud. And he talks about the harm that false statements inflict on the marketplace. So, you know, maybe he is trying to make an example of Trump here. He wants to show people that they can't conduct this type of fraudulent business practice. And to that end, he also extends, there was a special monitor appointed to oversee the financial dealings of the Trump Organization. And she's going to be kept on for another few years before Judge Angoron even released this ruling, she had put out a report, and it showed that she found continued errors in their financial records. So even after this case, or as it was already being tried, this type of fraud was potentially being perpetuated at the organization. Okay. And uh, I want to turn to, to Scott McFarland. You know, we talk about sort of the money flowing and, and surrounding, mm -hmm. whether it's Rudy Giuliani or Dominion, uh, some of these other civil cases. What does that mean, and, and what can we gain from what we know at this point in reference to this case and others uh, that are connected to former President Donald Trump. It's quite something, isn't it? People are wondering, when's Donald Trump going to stand trial in these criminal cases? And he is successfully throwing sand in the gears and pushing these trial dates back. There was supposed to be a trial on March 4th in the election subversion case. That's going to be punted till summer at the earliest. But the money cases are moving, not just the defamation case involving E. Jean Carroll. This massive judgment today. And then there are the related cases involving 2020. Rudy Giuliani loses in order to pay tens of millions of dollars, that massive Fox News Dominion defamation settlement for nearly three quarters of a billion dollars. There is no criminal accountability yet for the former president, but you can see the civil cases are moving along pretty swiftly. And Tarika, to Ricky's point about this case, and is it fundamentally different than other New York cases? Well, as the judge in this very lengthy opinion, tries to go to some lengths to explain. It is different in magnitude and duration and, as Katrina mentioned, this idea of pathology, this repetitive process of deceiving people in your business practices. The judge may argue, and the appellate court will have to decide, is it rare enough and exceptional enough to warrant this kind of procedural remedy? That's what the appeals court is going to decide. The Trump Lawyers will say, no, no, this is only happening because it's a political effort to weaken the former president, and everyone involved with moving this case forward will say, no, your business practices are yours, you're the author of them, and you must be held accountable. Because, again, we've been at this table, and maybe not myself normally <laughs> covering something like this, this special report, but you guys, without a doubt, what do you expect to hear from the former president? Do you think he comes out? 
with a statement or speaks to the public today? Well, there's no question about that. And let's not ignore, Tarika, the racial component of this. The former president has said Letitia James, the attorney general of New York, is a racist and is doing this for race-based reasons. He has played that aggressively. There is no evidence of that whatsoever, but that is part of his angry, volatile political response to this. Quite separate from what your documents say, what are the numbers add up to, what are the appraisals, what are the valuations? No. He wants to put this in as toxically charged a political context as possible. That may, I would, that has been part of his past. It may be part of his most immediate future. He stepped out of that courtroom each time he could before the media mm -hmm. called the attorney general a racist, called the case a witch hunt, and said that he should be paid damages for what he's suffering and what his family's going through. I, it has seemed to galvanize some level of political support for him, so I expect him to continue with that drumbeat. Because it's not over and we know there will be an appeal process, is this a win for Letitia James? It is a successful response to a case she brought. I'm not in the business of describing wins and losses for prosecutors or attorney generals. She had to know. Anyone who brings a case against the former president knows, and this is certainly playing out in Fulton County. If you take on the former president, you are taking on a phalanx of attorneys and supporters and scrutinizers. Everything will be scrutinized to the nth degree. Letitia James knew that. There's a remedy today that's now favorable to what she brought before the judge. And Ricky, same question to you. I mean, again, you, you've been there. You've been in courtrooms. Uh, you're very familiar, obviously, with Letitia James how this case was played out. You know, she wanted a permanent barring uh, for Donald Trump. It was three years based on this ruling. Uh, is this not only just obviously Major pointed out successful, but in your opinion, in your eyes, uh, is this good for her? This is a huge win for Letitia James. You have to remember she is the one who in fact uh, absolutely got this started, um, that she is the person who as I said on the day that this was filed, she dared, absolutely dared, the district attorney in New York, Alvin Bragg, to go forward with a prosecution, which he had declined to do. And so she wins. Um, anybody who says, well, she didn't get it all, she got so much of it all, she is definitely going to be someone who can celebrate tonight. At the same time, you have to remember that there are lawyers involved in all of these cases and that there are different lawyers involved in each case. This appeal is going to go forward with vigor. At the same time, there's a different group of lawyers that is going to go try the Alvin Bragg New York City, New York County criminal case involving falsification of business records. At the same time, there is a different group of lawyers that is going to go looking forward at the January 6th case and on through the others. Um, he does not, Donald St Trump is not stopped by this verdict. If anything, he's going to be energized by this judgment, not a verdict, by this judgment from this judge, which Donald Trump and his lawyers fully anticipated would be bad, and it is, and he has an argument as to why he is the exception to the rule, and that's just what he would like to have. All right, Ricky, thank you for that. As you heard, uh, we're going to go to Robert Costa. You heard Ricky say this didn't stop him but energized him. We've now given you a little bit of time to look through that document, and, and you've been able to pull out some key points here. If you could share with us what you've learned. Jerika, we're learning new details about what exactly is in this ruling. D the defendant, the main one here, former President Donald Trump, being ordered by the judge to pay the plaintiff, the state of New York, $354 million. So you think in just recent months, he now has over $400 million. If you add the E. Jean Carroll $80 million plus uh, to this, you're looking at over $400 million he's now facing against his core finances. But he has to pay $354 million. Eric Trump, his son, liable in the amount of $4 million, approximately $4 million for Eric Trump. Not Trump change. Donald Trump Jr., his other son, uh, along with Barron, who's not included in this at all, his youngest son, but his, one of, his oldest son, Donald Trump Jr., liable for $4 million, approximately. 
And then Alan Weisselberg, who's been at the center of all the Trump finances and those different court cases that have been circulating Trump organization for a long time, he's liable to the state of New York for a million dollars exactly. So you're looking at th about $364 million total in penalties for the defendants across the board, $354 million of that $364 million approximately for former President Donald Trump. Yeah, definitely a large amount of money. Scott McFarland, you're just getting a statement from the uh, Trump organization. Yeah, and it echoes a lot of what Donald Trump had been saying outside the courthouse each day. He calls this a miscarriage of justice. And he makes this argument that he made regularly during the trial that if this stands, businesses will leave New York. Great mm. businesses will exit the state. The statement includes this excerpt, Tarika. Every member of the New York business community, no matter the industry, should be gravely concerned with this gross overreach and brazen attempt by the attorney general to exert limitless power where no private or public harm has been established. If allowed to stand, this ruling will only further expedite the continuing exodus of companies from New York. That is the rhythm he was trying to make a drumbeat outside court when he held forth during the trial. Trika, there's also something worth noting on page 36 of this ruling, and it talks about a disagreement over the value of Mar-a-Lago, a property that the former president justifiably takes enormous pride in. Let me quote from this directly. Nonetheless, Donald Trump insisted that he believed Mar-a-Lago is worth between a billion and a billion five which would require not only valuing it as a private residence, which the deed prohibits, I'm still quoting here, but as more than the most expensive private residence listed in the country by approximately 400 percent. The essence of this case is the former president says things are valued as we say they are. And that's the only valuation that matters, what we say they are, not what they actually are, not what they're appraised at, not what their value is to bankers or insurers or others and particularly tax collectors, where oftentimes the variance benefits the Trump organization on both sides of the ledger, favorable loan rates, lower taxes. This is an example of that. Just one of, of many examples. Uh, Robert Costa, I understand you just got a statement from one of Donald Trump's attorneys. That's correct, Jerika. Alina Haba, who we have seen in the courtroom alongside former President Donald Trump throughout the civil fraud trial, has just issued a statement to CBS News and other organizations following this case. She said this verdict is, quote, manifest injustice. And she said, quote, given the grave stakes, we trust that the appellate division will overturn this egregious verdict and end this relentless persecution against my clients. And she says that if this stands as a ruling, quote, New York is no longer open for business. And this statement is, is indicative of what we're going to see in the coming months. We can't take the context out of this ruling away from what happened today. This happens in the middle of a presidential campaign. Just as former President Trump is about to secure the Republican nomination, should he do well in the South Carolina primary next week and on Super Tuesday in early March, and should he move toward that nomination. He is now going to be facing a criminal trial in New York on those hush money payments starting in late March, just as the general election begins, and having to be facing all of these appeals over this civil fraud ruling and having to potentially pay out hundreds of millions of dollars just months before the Republican National Convention and the election in November. And that's not to even go into what Scott McFarlane and others have been covering so well, Trump's looming federal trial on January 6th, which is currently before the Supreme Court, at least in terms of how Trump's immunity or claimed immunity could delay that trial. He's also facing a federal trial on his use of classified material and his bringing of them back uh, from the White House to Mar-a-Lago in Florida. All of this now circles Trump. But for Trump, having covered him for many years, it was as Major and others have said, this civil fraud trial, more than all of the other cases that has consumed his interests, has brought him back to lower Manhattan day after day for this trial because it has to deal with his money. And, and I see Major Garrett over here shaking his <laughs> head. Uh, One of the things this will go to is the value of Donald Trump's word. And there is something in this document, page 36 again, that sheds some light on that. When challenging a deposition about some particular tax valuation for Mar-a-Lago, he is asked, do you intend to do that? And the former president in the deposition says, when you say intend, intend doesn't mean we will do it. 
So a document that seems to suggest you have intention and are agreeing to that intention in perpetuity, as this particular tax document does, former President Trump says on the record, that doesn't mean we're going to do it. It means whatever we say it means, which goes to the heart of this underlying case and may, in that context, have political resonance beyond this afternoon. Everything is so politically upside down. We are 18 days before Super Tuesday, and when we get the expected comment from Donald Trump himself about this judgment, it would be such a contrast to what President Biden was speaking about today, the death of Alexei Navalny, this outspoken critic of Vladimir Putin, this pressing international issue of the day. Donald Trump's statements from his organization and his attorney are about a civil judgment. With no indication, this changes the political calculus for him or for the race at all. All right. And I want to give Ricky Kleeman a chance to, to chime in. I know she was speaking or, or also wanted to chime in really quickly after uh, Robert Costa was, was speaking about the election, obviously, and, and what the implications are there. Well, I think that uh, it, it's not only Robert Costa, but it's also Scott and Major. We've talked about this, uh, and, and it is clear that the political and the legal collide at all times here. One of the things that they also brought up that I think is really important, it's one thing to say, for the judge to say that, and the AG to say, that this affects the marketplace. And that's why there should be such an extraordinary punishment. And I note again that there has never been such an extraordinary punishment when there have been no victims who have complained and when the money was paid back. So this case is singular. And so that will fall right into the rubric of the campaign. And it's exactly the words that Alina Haba has said. There are people in the real estate industry in New York that were very concerned about a judgment of any kind of magnitude. And this is extraordinary magnitude. And it has been said by people in the real estate industry that if it can happen to Donald Trump, it could happen to anyone if you want to wipe out an industry. So we can't negate the fact that there are other feelings out there in the community and the business community. This is not a simple win or loss. This is really complicated. All right. Uh, Ricky Kleeman, Katrina Kaufman, Robert Costa, Scott McFarlane, Major Garrett, thank you guys all for breaking that down for us. Once again, the headline this hour, a blockbuster ruling in the New York civil fraud trial against former President Donald Trump. A judge found Trump and the Trump Organization is liable for falsifying business records by overvaluing his assets and exaggerating his net worth in order to get better terms on loans. Trump is now ordered to pay more than $350 million in penalties and is barred from holding office at a New York company and getting loans from New York banks for three years. His children are barred for two of those years. Our coverage will continue on CBS News Streaming, your local news, and tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Jerika Duncan in Washington. Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak, and we are following breaking news from New York City. The largest judgment to date has been issued against former President Donald Trump. Judge Ngoron has imposed a penalty of more than $350 million against Donald Trump, his adult sons, and his corporation in the civil fraud case brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. Well, the former president is being ordered to pay more than $354 million in damages. His co-defendants are being ordered to pay another $10 million in fines. The judge has also banned the former president from conducting business in the state of New York over the next three years. Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. are also prevented from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for the next two years. CBS News investigative reporter Graham Cates is with us now. He's been covering every aspect of this trial. Uh, Graham, I've been highlighting. I have lots of questions for you. But first of all, what's your top line take from the report so far? I think you nailed it. It's the incredible sum of money uh, that, that Trump in particular and his company uh, now need to pay uh, the state, 
Uh, of course, they're planning on appealing this. They've been plan uh, planning that from the very beginning. I spoke to a member of the legal team on the second day of the trial who told me that they thought their end game was appeals. But they're currently on the hook for really an incredible sum of money. And uh, he, as recently as last year in a deposition, uh, claimed to have uh, on hand about $400 million in cash. If you add this sum that he's been penalized uh, with the, the amount that came out recently in the E. Jean Carroll trial, that more than tops what, what he claimed to have on hand. So it, it immediately creates an enormous cash crunch for yeah. former President Trump. $354 million in this case, $83.3 million in the latest E. Jean Carroll defamation case. That's on top of the $5 million from the previous E. Jean Carroll case. And uh, there was also a $1.6 million judgment against the Trump Organization mm -hmm. for tax fraud uh, in, 20, in 2022. And that's on top of all of the other cases that continue to persist. Uh, Graham, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is uh, how this has helped him on the campaign trail. And he has felt buoyed by this by his supporters who have also opened their pocketbooks. Given that we're talking about a tremendous sum of money, are Trump supporters able to help with these, not just legal fees, but with these judgments against him? Yeah, no, it's actually a big difference. So their donations through their PAC, they, they can go to, toward his lawyers and that kind of thing. But when there's a judicial uh, judgment against you, that has to come from uh, your own pocket. The, the donors across the country can't um, contribute to this, uh, to this fine. So he's go going, he and his company are going to have to be the ones to, to put this forward. And in order to appeal it, uh, they have to actually put forward a significant sum in order to appeal it. It's kind of like a bond. So explain that for our viewers who maybe are less uh, familiar with with that requirement here in New York than others. Um, the president has announced even before receiving this judgment from uh, from Judge Ungaron that they intended to appeal this. But the money from the judgment still needs to be set aside. Why is that? And if he is unable to come up with the amount of cash that is required, how does that affect uh, his legal strategy moving forward? Yeah, think of it as just kind of a, a guarantee. You, you can't in New York use a, an appeal in order to avoid paying uh, altogether. You have to be able to foot some of it so that you're not just using the, the judicial process to delay what you've already been ordered to do. Uh, and, and how this ends up playing out, uh, we, we have to wait and see. But we know they intend to appeal and we know that they can't just entirely ignore the judgment while that's going forward. All right. Graham Cates, thank you. Stick around with us. I want to bring in now Jessica Levinson. She is a CBS News legal contributor and a professor at Loyola Law School. Uh, Jessica, I want to ask about a particular thing that I, I read in, uh, in this report that we just got from Judge Arthur Angoran. He said that uh, he really hit hard the former president and his co-defendants in terms of them not uh, assuming really any responsibility. I'm going to quote from uh, the part of the section that says refusal to admit error. He said he, the judge writes their complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological. I I haven't read in any of the legal opinions that we've seen anything that's quite as harsh as that. What do you make of this ruling? Well, I think it's emblematic of what we saw during the trial. The trial was a bit of a circus, and you certainly saw Judge Angoran really clash with the former president. I mean, let's be honest that when Trump took the witness stand, he treated that not really as a witness stand so much as a press conference and really railed against the judge, his clerk. That's why there was a gag order in this case, and really the entire justice system, both civil and criminal. With respect to that language, again, I think it really does um, exemplify what we saw in the trial. And let's remember that this is a judge who already found before the trial began in a summary judgment motion that Trump had committed fraud and that this ruling is based on a finding of liability on six of the seven other claims, excuse me, of the six other claims in the seven mm -hmm. count complaint. Now, there are judges, I mean, we only talk about the big cases, but there are certainly judges who write like that, 
I would say I think it's probably more the exception than the rule. All right. Uh, another thing, as, as we're talking about uh, this judgment, uh, I want to quote another part uh, in the summary. Uh, the judge writes, when confronted at trial with the statements, defendants' fact and expert witnesses simply denied reality. Given the amount of evidence that was presented, 40 witnesses, 43 days of testimony, what legal basis does Donald Trump have for his appeal? So I think that the reason that the judge wrote that is that he said this is not a battle of experts. And I think what, and I will get to your question about an appeal, but I think the reason the phrasing goes that way mm -hmm. is because what he really wants to do is show that this isn't what the defense claimed it was, which was, well, look, some people just value property differently and property valuation is inherently subjective and that's something that can occur and we really just have a difference of opinion as to what's appropriate. And he's saying, no, there's reality and then there's what you argued. In this case, I think the appeal would go to a couple of different findings here. Obviously, I think that they're going to say that it's too much in this case to bar Trump from asking for loans mm -hmm. by any business that is chartered in New York right. by saying that he can't be an officer of any organization or corporation or director of any officer or corporation that is situated in New York for three years, that they have gone too far in saying that there has to be an independent monitor of the companies for three years, that the amount is too high. And I think that the appeal will focus in on the idea that the banks made money off of these loans. So where is the victim here? $354 million is not appropriate when banks made money. I think, again, not my argument, but I think that would be theirs. Yes, uh, and the judge does um, does talk about that. Uh, you brought up, though, something that there hasn't, most people have been fixated uh, at this point just on that big headline of $354 million, but, you mentioned something else, which is that for the next three years, uh, Donald Trump and the Trump Organization and its affiliates are barred from applying for loans from any financial institution chartered by or registered with the New York State Department of Financial Services. Uh, that seems to be a, a wide swath, given that New York is the banking capital of our nation. So does that mean that that essentially the organization, the Trump organization and Donald Trump personally will not be able to apply for any loans for the next three years? It, at least for, again, those organizations that are chartered or let's just say broadly based in New York, even though that's actually too general, general legally speaking. So yes, this is not just about the amount of money. And it's of course, completely natural that we're focusing on that amount because it's huge, $354 million is a huge amount of money. But part of what Attorney Ge General Letitia James asked for was other remedies, saying, I don't just want monetary damages, I want them to stop doing business in New York, at least for a specific period of time. Judge Ngoran, and this is a little bit in the weeds, actually took back part of the remedy that he had given when he granted the summary judgment, the cancellation of the business certificates, and he said, I'm modifying my previous order. I actually think that makes his judgment a little stronger going into the appeal, but it is absolutely the case that what Letitia James asked for and what she got was not just a big amount of money, but to Trump and the Trump organization and his adult sons, don't do business anymore in New York and don't ask for loans in New York for at least three years. And again, we really don't trust you, so have this independent monitor who looks over your business for at least three years. And one that the corporation itself will have to pay for. Okay, Jessica Levinson, Graham Cates, thank you for your analysis. We're going to continue to dig into all of this over this quick break, but don't go away. More coverage of today's landmark ruling is next. Hey there, welcome to the uplift. I thought she was a groom, and I stepped back and I went, oh, you're the queen. She's gonna be with me every instant that I'm alive. I just wanted to see if you'd go to Disneyland with me today. I look over at him and he's smiling. I'm gonna remember that the rest of my life. They told us when he was gonna be born, he was only gonna live for 
30 minutes. It's really a miracle that he's with us today. The Uplift. Stream now on the free CBS News app. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. She's a country music legend, philanthropist, fashion icon, and now rock star. I think there's a lot to be said about being comfortable with who you are. Find out what's next for Dolly Parton when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She is a beloved American icon and head of a media empire. But is Oprah Winfrey happy? How do you define happiness? Yeah, I call it happierness. Find out when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. It was genocide. A deliberate effort by the United States government to eliminate the food source that was relied upon by Native American tribes. American bison were slaughtered and Native Americans displaced. And that's how tribes were subjugated to reservations and our lands were taken. But now, through conservation efforts at Yellowstone. Buffalo provided everything that we needed. Now they need help. A herd grows. We need to step up and help them. And a culture is reborn. When the buffalo return and come back, that's when our tribe will begin to heal. Yellowstone Bison Revival, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. I'm always looking at where the story goes next. I hope that our guests come on and share something. For Americans, they're feeling it pretty hard. I know. That you will leave better informed, I can tell you that. Morning news matters because it sets the tone for your day and it's a way of getting you started. We're going to uplift you. We're going to send you out your way day to day. That first draft of history, it happens right here. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Lana Zak. We continue to follow this breaking news for you from New York City. The largest judgment to date has been issued against former President Donald Trump. Judge Ngoron has imposed a penalty of more than $350 million against Donald Trump, as well as his adult sons and his corporation in that civil fraud case brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. The former president is being ordered to pay more than $354 million in damages. His co-defendants are being ordered to pay another $10 million in fines. The judge has also banned the former president from conducting business in the state of New York over the next three years. Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. are prevented from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for the next two years. We have team coverage of this ruling now. Scott McFarlane and Major Garrett are in Washington. Katrina Kaufman is here with me in New York. So I'm going to start first of all with CBS News campaign reporter and attorney Katrina Kaufman here with me. So Katrina, it's interesting. Most of this is against former President Trump, the Trump Corporation. But then there are also specific times where Judge Ngoron calls out Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. Talk to us about the judgments against Donald Trump's children. Yeah, so along with Trump, this really implicates his sons as well. They are not able to do business in New York for two years, and it really puts in question who is going to lead the Trump Corporation. It can't be a Trump family member. Um, and another part that I thought was interesting was about Ivanka, who 
is not a defendant in this case. She was originally, but it was dismissed against her. But when she took the stand, she said that she didn't recall more times than I could possibly count. And the judge notes her testimony and says that while he found her thoughtful, articulate, and a poised witness, uh, he found that very suspect. And he really just questions credibility of witnesses throughout this opinion. There was another witness, Eli Bartov, who Trump thought was really a star witness for his case. He's an accounting professor from NYU. And basically, in Goron ultimately said later that if you pay someone a million dollars, they'll say anything on your behalf. And in this opinion, he again says that he just really didn't find that testimony credible. All right, I'm going to bring in now CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett. He is in Washington. Uh, Major, I want to get your take on mm -hmm. some of what we're hearing. There is very strong language coming from sure. Judge Ngoron in all of this. In fact, saying that, uh, that the defendant's facts and expert witnesses denied reality, saying mm -hmm. uh, th about the defendants that their complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological. <laughs> and at one point, he says that the defendant's refusal to admit error, indeed, to continue it, according to the independent monitor, constrains this court to conclude that they will engage in it going forward unless judicially restrained. Uh, having had just a little bit of time to start to look into uh, this judgment, what jumps out to you? So Judge Angora knew that this would be appealed, and he knew that the argument that this was a selective application of New York law based on valuations and alleged fraud would stand out, and that he better have an explanation as to why this case was handled the way it was. And his explanation, Lana, is exactly as you just articulated. The judge says, in the pattern of conversation and testimony and actual evidence, the Trump organization, led by the former president, refused to acknowledge errors did not say that it would have to take any remedial action to correct the obvious errors in their business practices, fraudulent as asserted by the New York Attorney General, and if not penalized, would inevitably continue to engage in manifest fraud in New York. So much so that not only is the former president required to pay this disgorgement, that's the technical term, mm -hmm. but others in the Trump organization found to be liable for this sort of culture of fraudulency are barred from participation, two of them in particular, right. for the remainder of their business careers, Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney. So what is evident in this explanation from the judge is not only the fact pattern, not only the law, but when this gets to an appeals court to say, I had to take these steps because if I didn't, not only would the public in New York be harmed, but the very business climate former President Trump says is endangered by this judgment would be threatened even more. Major, I want to follow up with you just on one point that you were making right now, which is that Weisselberg and McConney uh, have been banned not for a period of three years, as is the case for, our, for the former president, or two years, as is the case for his, his adult sons, but for the rest of their lives, uh, mm -hmm. really, in conducting any business here in New York. So um, what, why do you think there is a difference in a harsher penalty uh, for those two officers of the Trump Corporation as opposed to the people people who actually have Trump in their name. Because they were the ones closest to and with direct supervisorial roles in all of these representations. And it is an acknowledgment that the Trump organization, through not only the former president but his two sons, is in part a branding organization. And the brand does matter and they are representative of that brand but are not in every instance necessarily responsible or if not responsible directly involved in all these numerical valuations the other two gentlemen quite obviously are and it was their career path within the trump organization to do that work they were most directly involved in it and from the judge's perspective therefore most liable for it and to receive therefore the harshest sanction all right major thank you for your insights i'm going to bring in now cbs news congressional correspondent scott mcfarland also there in washington scott we're already seeing fundraising coming off of the trump campaign uh trump make america great again 2024 writes and the witch hunt breaking from trump democratic new york judge just ruled against me talk to us about the response from the former president his legal team and how this is likely going to play out on the campaign trail 
Well, the most likely response is actually going to be the appeal that is imminent in this case and has been forecast for weeks, if not months. But the political positioning of Donald Trump has been consistent throughout this case, arguing invariably that this is a witch hunt, that it's a miscarriage of justice. And in fact, the statement issued by Trump.org right after this judgment was that it's a miscarriage of justice that is going to cause an exodus of businesses out of New York State if it's left to stand. This was somewhat predictable. There was a silver lining in here for Donald Trump. There was a partial victory. There was not an order that he dissolve his business. What the judge has ordered here is an independent monitor, an independent director of compliance to be paid for by Trump.org, which will allow the business to remain a thing. Now, this business has obviously made Trump an awful lot of money, but I think it's also something in which he's taken great pride and tried to build his brand before his political career. The business stays in place. But something else just keeps jumping out of me from this judgment. It's what the judge says about Trump's children and the language the judge uses in the order. First of all, about Trump's two sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump. The judge finds that they intentionally falsified business records and that they are to be barred from being an officer of a corporation in New York for three years. But I'm actually more struck by the, the phrases he uses in describing Ivanka Trump, who famously testified at this trial. The judge emphasizes that Ivanka Trump had no recollection of any of the events that gave rise to this action when she was being questioned during the trial. But she suddenly had quite a bit of memory when she was being questioned by her own attorneys in response. And what the judge here says is that her lack of memory aside, he'll let the emails and the records determine the outcome here. And he found that the emails and the records through Ivanka Trump were part of the reason, part of the justification for this ruling. But the judge also made a point of saying in his judgment that Ivanka Trump was a thoughtful, articulate, and poised witness, but the court found her inconsistent recall a suspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's noteworthy that not only does this judgment have implications on Trump's two sons, but the judge spent a lot of bandwidth in this order talking about his impressions of the children and what role they played in all this. And Lon, if I could jump in real quick, Please also uh, yes. quoting from the judge's opinion, because that is really what's going to be before the appellate jurisdiction on this. I want to read from it directly. They are accused, meaning the Trump Organization, former President Trump, his children and the others, only of inflating asset values to make more money. The documents prove this over and over again. I continue to quote, this is a venal sin, not a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. Defendants did not commit murder or arson. They did not rob a bank at gunpoint. Donald Trump is not Bernard Madoff. Yet defendants are incapable, the judge says, of admitting the error of their ways. Instead, the judge writes, they adopt a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil posture that the evidence belies. The court is not constituted to judge morality. It is constituted to find facts and apply the law. In this particular case, applying the law to the facts, the court intends to protect the integrity of the financial marketplace and thus the public as a whole. This goes to the larger construct of the appeal. This judge is saying, I'm not going out of bounds here. I am doing this for a very specific reason, informed by not only the evidence, but the defendant's attitude to that evidence and the fact pattern that they must take account for. I had highlighted that same section, Major. Uh, <laughs> Katrina, I want to get your take on this appeal question. Uh, one of the, the arguments that was raised was that this is common business practice mm -hmm. and that the Trump Organization wasn't doing anything other than any other big corporation in New York does. The judge, I want to quote from the document, wrote, indeed, the common excuse that everybody does it is all the more reason to strive for honesty and transparency and to be vigilant in enforcing the rules Rules. How much of that is going to be part of the defense as this is appealed by Trump? They absolutely might incorporate that into their defense. And I do think that this is potentially a common New York real estate business practice. But yeah, in the very same passage you're reading, he says New York means business in combating business fraud. Um, and I think that another part of it, though, is what we were talking about earlier, which is the lack of contrition as well um, in, in the Bernie Madoff comparison, actually, which at the very end of the trial, I think one of the last things Judge Angoran asked was for them to compare Trump to Bernie Madoff. And Madoff actually said that he was sorry for what he did. 
In this opinion, the judge notes that even, you know, to this day, Trump says that he did nothing wrong here. In fact, the only mistake he ever admitted was the size of his triplex, which I think he accidentally admitted when he made that grand closing statement during closing arguments. He said that they accidentally inflated that right. and that was a mistake. But other than that, he says that his financial statements are perfect, that there were disclaimers, the banks weren't supposed to rely on them. And so I think that that really factors into this judgment as well. Let's get into some, the, the extent of those errors or that inflation. Uh, Major, if you could talk to our viewers a little bit about, in particular, Mar-a-Lago and how much the Trump Organization had valued that property at, because I think you have some very interesting insights into that. Yes, I'll flip to it, but it's page 36. I'll try to recall it from memory. Essentially, the Trump Organization and the former president, who takes justifiable pride in Mar-a-Lago, I've covered many events there, it is a very nice place, said the valuation of that should properly be estimated between a billion and one and a half billion dollars, far in excess of any kind of valuation ever ascribed to Mar-a-Lago. And as the document in the court judgment says, to, for that to be true, it would have to be 400 times more valuable than the most valuable property anywhere in the United States. And that, and I'm inserting these words, not from the judgment itself, strains credulity and doesn't add up in, in essence. And that is one of the things that the judge found was a persistent pattern and one of a pattern that was sort of incorporated into the business culture of the Trump Organization, this judgment finds. You know, he has been called before the Teflon Don uh, because so many of the conventional wisdom uh, items don't seem to apply. Um, it, uh, just even looking back at, you know, the, the Trump Organization being convicted of tax fraud in 2022 and being fined $1.6 million, that would have killed another presidential campaign that would have severely hurt another organization. Um, does this judgment hurt Donald Trump? It might. There is always the possibility within the aura around Donald Trump that something will begin the process of re-examination. I am schooled by the history that I've experienced since the summer of 2015 when I began on a daily basis to cover then-candidate Trump, eventually nominee Trump, President Trump, and now former Trump, former President Trump, that there is a resilience around not only his marketed and built name brand and political brand, but there is a resilience around the sense that his supporters have that the reason that he is in these legal barrels is not because he did something wrong, but because some forces are trying to knock him down. And by trying to knock him down, they are trying to knock down the aspirations of his supporters. And as long as that sense of connectedness continues, judgments like this, however harshly worded, will probably have scarce political impact. Scott McFarlane, your take. Does this hurt him? Well, I mean, look at the bottom line of this judgment, notwithstanding the money. Judges ruled Donald Trump is not fit to be an officer of a corporation in the state of New York for three years. That based on his conduct, the fraud that the judge found, that he's not able to do that or rightful to do that. But he is able and rightful to be the leading contender for the Republican nomination for the White House. Can't run a New York business, but might be positioned to run the country. That contrast just jumps out at me. And no matter what the appeal is here, even if the money gets knocked down or the money gets erased, you can't erase that judgment from a judge in New York State. And I, I can't get past that because I think fundamentally that's the big non-financial takeaway of this ruling. The appeals will happen, and Trump has found himself to be particularly effective, not just willing, but effective at delaying things in court, stalling things out, slowing things down, and potentially he could extend the time frame on this quite a bit. But you can't change the sentiment of the judge, which is that even though this case is financial in nature, it's a pretty damning indictment in the 92-page judgment. All right, Katrina Kaufman, that question about the delay, about the appeal, how long, what is the timeline now for an appeal on this case? Of when he has to appeal by? You know, I'm not positive what the timeline is for that, but one thing I was thinking about is that I was sitting in the New York Hush Money trial yesterday when they were setting the trial date, and his lawyer was talking about the burden that trying to prepare and then be a part of that case is going to put on him while he's campaigning. And so now 
He's embroiled in an appeal. He's going to be appealing the E. Jean Carroll verdict. Mm -hmm. He's going to be appealing this verdict. He has a criminal trial starting and all of that while he's campaigning. So whether or not this hurts him in the polls, I mean, he's engaged in all of these cases, not to mention the other criminal cases that he's also uh, being prosecuted in that are going to be moving forward as well. So this is all just a big burden on Donald Trump. And speaking of those other criminal cases, we're going to dig into that on the other side of this break. I want to thank Major Garrett, Katrina Kaufman, and Scott McFarlane. We are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to head back over to Georgia. We're going to speak with our own Nicole Killian and get an update on one of the criminal cases that is facing the former president. Well, let me start with this. This really happened. Have you told the government? Did any of that make sense? What's your response? You want me to just What's keep wrong going? with that argument? What have you learned? Do you know why? 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 It's time for 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terror system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. He was there when the war in Ukraine started. Extreme history. That's a big moment. The extraordinary story behind Sean Penn's new Paramount Plus documentary, Superpower, when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discoveries, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. Human remains found this week. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. A gripping true crime original. 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. How can we become our best selves? That may be more about character than talent. The ultimate mark of your potential is how far you've climbed, not how high you've gone. Realizing your true potential with Adam Grant as we go person to person. As we have been reporting, a judge here in New York City has ordered former President Donald Trump and his organization to pay more than $350 million. Now, that is the largest judgment against the former president and his organization. He has been plagued by civil and criminal cases. One of those cases, a case of election interference in Georgia. That one has had many of its own headlines recently, as Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis has been accused of impropriety for a relationship that she had with a, for, with a, with a fellow prosecutor. Today, we heard from Fannie Willis's father. He said he learned about her relationship with that special prosecutor, Nathan Wade, at the same time as the rest of the public Following all of the ins and outs of that contentious hearing, we have CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian outside of the courthouse in Atlanta. So, Nicole, first of all, let's start big picture. What is 
you know what, actually, let's even reset for our viewers because we've been talking about a lot of different cases that the former president has been involved in. Remind our viewers what this case is in Georgia. Well, obviously, this is a case that is still ongoing. Uh, the stems from the indictment last summer of former President Trump and 18 co-defendants uh, with respect to alleged election interference uh, here in Georgia back in 2020. And so uh, while this case has not yet gone to trial, uh, we are kind of in a holding pattern right now because Earlier this year, there was a complaint that was filed by one of the co-defendants in the case, Michael Roman, alleging an improper relationship between the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, who brought these charges in this indictment, and the special prosecutor who was involved in this case, Nathan Wade. So for the better part of the month, uh, we have been trying to get more information about their nature of their relationship. And so these last two days here in Fulton County, there has been a hearing to do a deeper dive and actually hear both from Nathan Wade and from Fonnie Willis, both of whom took the stand yesterday, confirming that they did, in fact, have a romantic relationship, although both of them claimed that there was no wrongdoing uh, on their part, uh, that in terms of trips that they took together, that in most instances, the district attorney reimbursed Nathan Wade. Of course, there's a lot of concern considering that Wade earns his living and his paycheck uh, from Willis's office and to the extent that any taxpayer dollars might have been used. Uh, that is kind of what this hearing is getting at, whether or not there was any financial benefit or financial conflict on the part of the district attorney. Uh, but she told uh, the judge uh, that she paid for everything. She reimbursed Wade uh, when they took many of those trips. And yeah, Nicole, this is a real U-turn for a, a case about election interference. And it's really Really, at its core, about that phone call that the uh, that the former president made, trying asking the attorney general there to just simply find some more votes. Um, uh, but now the prosecutors themselves are on the witness stand, though, as we heard from Fonnie Willis yesterday, she asserted, I am not on trial. As much as you want to make this about me, I am not the person who's on trial. So, Nicole, I'm wondering if you can tell us, is there any sense of what the chances are that Willis or Wade might be disqualified from this trial as a result of these hearings? Yeah, well, it's a very important question, and the call that the former president made was to the Secretary of State uh, back in uh, 2020 and early 2021 when he was asking Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to find him the votes. But, you know, even with evidence like that, this is this entire case is now in question. Again, if a judge finds any wrongdoing or even the appearance of wrongdoing on the part of the district attorney and Nathan Wade. Now, there are many legal experts who have filed a friend of the court brief suggesting that uh, while the optics of their relationship may not be great, it's not, doesn't really rise to the threshold of trying to disqualify her from the case. But again, that is a decision that this judge will have to make, whether she should be disqualified from the case, whether her office should be disqualified, whether Nathan Wade should be uh, removed from this case, and or whether this case needs to move to another jurisdiction altogether. So some pretty big implications here for uh, the 2020 election interference case. Uh, obviously, uh, the longer this goes on, it does also impact uh, the timeline in terms of these proceedings because the district attorney wanted to go to trial uh, in August of this year, but that too uh, now up in the air. Yeah, that, that uh, phone call to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and the ensuing chaos, no one expected that it would end up where it is now with hearings about the prosecutor and the attorney general. All right, Nicole, thank you. We're going to have more coverage of the major ruling against Donald Trump in his civil fraud case here in New York. Stay with us. Hey there, welcome to the uplift. I thought she was a groom. And I stepped back and I went, oh, you're the queen. 
She's going to be with me every instant that I'm alive. I just wanted to see if you'd go to Disneyland with me today. I look over at him and he's smiling. I'm going to remember that the rest of my life. They told us when he was going to be born, he was only going to live for 30 minutes. It's really a miracle that he's with us today. The Uplift. Stream now on the free CBS News app. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of it. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has a glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. She's a country music legend, philanthropist, fashion icon, and now rock star. But I think there's a lot to be said about being comfortable with who you are. Find out what's next for Dolly Parton when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. She is a beloved American icon and head of a media empire. But is Oprah Winfrey happy? How do you define happiness? Yeah, I call it happy earnest. Find out when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS Reports. It was genocide. A deliberate effort by the United States government to eliminate the food source that was relied upon by Native American tribes. American bison were slaughtered and Native Americans displaced. And that's how tribes were subjugated to reservations and our lands were taken. But now, through conservation efforts at Yellowstone. Buffalo provided everything that we needed. Now they need help. A herd grows. We need to step up and help them. And a culture is reborn. When the buffalo return and come back, that's when our tribe will begin to heal. Yellowstone Bison Revival, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We continue to follow breaking news in that civil court case against President, former President Donald Trump. The judge, Arthur Ngoron, has imposed a penalty of more than $350 million against both the former president as well as his adult sons and his corporation. That case brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James. The former president has been ordered now to pay more than $354 million in damages. It's believed that he needs to pay that amount in the next 30 days. His co-defendants are being ordered to pay another $10 million in fines. Meanwhile, the judge also imposed other panel penalties banning the former president from conducting business in the state of New York over the next three years. And his sons, Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr., are prevented from serving as an officer or director of any New York corporation for the next two years. Now, as we've reported, that sum north of $350 million will need to be paid by the former president. And both Eric and Donald Trump Jr. have each been ordered to pay a little bit more than $4 million each. We also want to tell you about former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg. He's been ordered to pay $1 million. CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleenan joins us now. Ricky, always good to talk to you. So I, I want to get your take on this question I've been pondering. What do you think is the bigger penalty that's more impactful to the former president? This $354 million judgment against him or these other bans, the, un the inability to conduct business in New York for the next three years, the inability to even secure loans from any institution that is based here in New York? 
I think the injunctive relief, which is what you are referring to, the inability to be an officer or director, the inability to do business within the state of New York, in the end, is far more impactful. And the reason I say that is because the essence, the center of the Trump business real estate empire is in New York. And this is really putting him, and perhaps in his mind, almost far more important, putting his sons out of business in their prime of life. And so what are they going to do? The money, which is a staggering sum of money by any scale, on any scale, is something that they had to expect because Letitia Daines, the attorney general, had gone from $150 million into the twos, up into the threes, up to $370 million. So when you get to $354 million, you are talking about uh, a sum of money, the likes of which almost no one or no company sees in terms of a penalty. The money, which I know it, it has to be posted, it's one thing to say it has to be paid within seven days. It's a whole other thing to say, how does the legal process work? He has a right, as does the organization, as do the other people who were sanctioned by the judge's decision. They have a right of appeal. And in the process of filing for an appeal, it's not that they have to pay the judgment. They can ask that the judgment be stayed pending that appeal. But in order to go forward with an appeal in the state of New York, you have to post the money or you have to post a surety bond. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be easy under any circumstances. Donald Trump must appeal because he needs an appellate tribunal to be able to look at this amount of money and decide if it is too punitive in nature and should be reduced. So, Ricky, on that, um, I, I understand $350 million. The mind boggles thinking about that amount of cash. But when you look at the Trump Organization and the massive holdings that they have, couldn't the, the former president just say, Mar-a-Lago, Trump Tower, these are our, this is my guarantee? Why Is it actually going to be that difficult for him? Or might he actually have to sell any of his properties or holdings? Well, if, in fact, at some point in the future, he actually has to pay this amount of money or the organization has to pay, it would seem that some of the holdings would have to be sold. Now, you're also dealing with the fact of looking at the properties within New York and the fact that the judge has wanted no business done by the Trump organization. Mm -hmm. So who going to manage this kind of a sale. There are all kinds of open questions here. You also have to remember with Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago is a club. Mar-a-Lago has a restrictive covenant, meaning that in the deed to Mar-a-Lago, as it exists today, it cannot be sold at this point in time with that restriction to become something that is a residence. So it would have to be sold as a club. We don't know how this money is going to be raised. And I'm not saying it's going to be raised to pay off a judgment. I'm saying it's going to be raised in order to post money for an appeal mm -hmm. or collateralize, give collateral to a company that would be willing to take a surety bond. That's a risky surety bond. If in fact, what you're asking for for collateral to say, OK, I'm going to get paid one way or the other if at some point that has to be sold. So this is a conundrum. Yeah. Um, Ricky, having had an opportunity to look through the judge's uh, uh, report here, uh, I think it's about 90 pages. Um, what jumps out to you and, and what areas do you think that the former president may still have available to him in terms of trying to mount a successful appeal? Well, former President Trump has said from the very beginning of this case that he found that the judge was biased against him. He has gone on social media. He has said things outside the courtroom about his perceived bias on the part of Judge Angoran. One of the reasons that Donald Trump has available to him is that the judge, in fact, decided that there was fraud 
on the paperwork before he held a trial on what the remedy would be. And so it becomes, looking at it from the point of view of either Donald Trump, his lawyers, or those who are upset about this kind of a judgment, that what they would say is, like Alice in Wonderland, it's first the verdict, then the trial. And that's a paraphrase of Alice in Wonderland, um, which is first the sentence, right. then the trial. But what you have is the reality for Donald Trump is to say, there was no way I, Donald Trump, could get a fair trial from this judge who had already been decided, uh, who had already made a decision against me, so that the trial was nothing but a show trial, according to the defense, in order to exact the maximum penalty. So there are reasons that Donald Trump can go up on appeal. In addition, the Associated Press made a study of this particular law and how it is used in the state of New York. And when it studied over 70 cases, there was no case that found that a business would really have to dissolve um, when there was no victim that said that they were victimized or did not get their money back. So this case stands on its own. An appellate court is ultimately going to make a decision as to whether this remedy is out of control over the top, according to the defense in its appellate brief, I assume, because there's never been any other company that did not create victims that really suffered that would have that kind of a penalty. The court may say that this penalty is too much, or the appellate court may say this was a pattern of activity of deception and of fraud. It remains to be seen. And on that, I want to bring up the statement that we got from the Trump Organization. They wrote, today's ruling is a gross miscarriage of justice. Every member of the New York business community, no matter the industry, should be gravely concerned with this gross overreach. And we also heard from Trump's lawyer uh, reacting to this statement. She wrote, this verdict is, is a manifest injustice. Given the grave stakes, we trust that the appellate division will overturn this egregious verdict and end this relentless persecution against my clients. All of that, of course, underlying, as you were explaining, Ricky, the contentious relationship that the former president had at times with the court. Uh, and that gag order, for example, that was imposed on the former president. Now that the that the judgment has been issued, what happens with that gag order? Does that go away at this point? Well, it's a good question, because usually a gag order is for the purpose of the trial up to the point of a verdict, or in this case, a judgment. However, there was another purpose involved with this particular gag order, which had to do with the question of threats not only against the judge, but against personnel in the courthouse. By all normal process, the gag order would cease. But I don't know in this particular case. It may be that the attorney general wants the gag order to continue during the appellate process. We will see what comes to pass. Hey, Ricky, real quick, um, let's talk about the fact that this was a civil trial and not a criminal trial. As such, what we're talking about are these penalties that involve uh, the former president and his co-defendant's ability to do work here in the state and uh, fines that they need to pay, but it does not carry uh, the potential for any prison time. Uh, what is behind the decision to make this merely civil, and is there the possibility that criminal charges may ever follow? Criminal charges are not going to follow this case. Um, the uh, jurisdiction of the attorney general in the state of New York is civil and only civil. The, the attorney general, when she had gone through this case, basically handed it over to the district attorney's office of New York County, which is Manhattan. During the tenure of the previous district attorney, they looked at this case and it seemed that it was possible that there was going to be an indictment in this case. When the new district attorney, Alvin Bragg, came along, he decided not to go forward with any criminal charges involving these allegations, and instead he chose the path 
of falsification of business records having to do with the allegation of paying off um, the pornographic star Stormy Daniels. That case is a criminal case. It is going to trial on March the 25th. All right, Ricky Kleeman, thank you so much. Coming up after the break, a member of our political unit is going to be here to break down the political implications of this ruling and how Donald Trump uses decisions like this to fundraise. Stay with us. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We love music as much as you do. CBS Mornings. Your morning routine just <laughs> got better. I love that. CBS Mornings. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean in Did any of that make what sense? Have you What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount Plus. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Dragon Capsule here in space. Sightseers in space, the thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, it would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Morning news matters because it sets the tone for your day and it's a way of getting you started. We take you places, we teach you new things, and we make you feel like, you know, it's not all bad. We're going to uplift you. People say to me, you always seem to be having a good time. I mean, you know what? You're right. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. When weather turns extreme. A massive storm with winds of 150 miles per hour. The storm strengthened again overnight. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real, you'll have time to get prepared. Feel the forecast. Weather when it matters most on CBS News. I wake up every morning asking what's happening in the world, why is this happening, and how do we answer that question? After the tragic loss of beloved newsman Tim Russert, his son went on a worldwide journey to find himself. I struggled with his grief for a long time. How Luke Russert is honoring the legacy of his father when we go person to person. Hello, I'm Lana Zank. We are continuing our coverage of Donald Trump's civil fraud trial. The former president has been ordered to pay more than $350 million. His co-defendants are being ordered to pay another $10 million in fines. All have had restrictions put on them in terms of their ability to conduct business in New York over the next several years. CBS News campaign reporter Olivia Rinaldi is in Washington. She has been following this election. So, Olivia, we want to ask you, how might this decision impact the former president's chances in the 2024 race? Hi, Lana. Well, if anything, this will just complicate matters further as it comes to funding. 
just minutes after this decision came down, Donald Trump sent out a fundraising text to his supporters that read he's calling on one million pro-Trump patriots to pitch in and donate to him. This mirrors exactly what he did just a few weeks ago when the decision came down in the E. Jean Carroll trial that he would owe $83.3 million there. So in total, he's looking at legal fees that are skyrocketing above $440 million. That is an astounding figure. So really, that's the hurdle that Donald Trump has to deal with when it comes to these trials. This is not something that the voters are particularly impacted by, at least his voters are particularly impacted by, but it is the fundraising that is the issue. Now, one of the key things that happened this week was that Donald Trump endorsed new leaders for the RNC, which include his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, and Chris Lasavita, who is a senior advisor to Donald Trump to act as that chief operating officer for the RNC. And what is crucial about that movement is really means that the RNC and Trump can start coordinating when he is the official nominee. That's part of the reason why he wants Nikki Haley to get out of the race so quickly so that he can be the presumptive nominee for the RNC and get ability to work with some of those legal fees. So that is what is crucial there, because these fees are starting to pile up. This will become a problem for him going forward, having to pay off these hundreds of millions of dollars that are facing him. Yeah. Uh, and as we heard from our legal experts, while contributors can help out with the legal fees, they cannot help out with these judgments against him. Um, but you mentioned, Olivia, that last time we were in a similar position reporting on a judgment against a former president. Immediately, a fundraising email went out. We got this email now in front of us again from uh, the Trump 2024 campaign asking for money. How, how much does this actually fuel Trump's fundraising efforts? What was the effect specifically following the E. Jean Carroll verdict? It absolutely fuels the, the, his base and giving him money just immediately. We know from the mugshot over the summer, that was one of the largest fundraising days that Donald Trump has ever had. That was, of course, related to the Georgia Fulton County election interference case that is also ongoing there when he was booked and he had his mugshot photo taken. They were fundraising off of that and he raised, mul raised multiple millions of dollars in that case. And I suspect we're going to see the same thing here with Ian Jean Carroll and as it relates to the New York civil fraud trial going forward. And uh, you mentioned Nikki Haley, the only Republican contender who is still standing besides the former president. Have we heard any reaction from her yet? Nothing so far that I have seen since I've got on the set here, but she has consistently said that Donald Trump is embroiled with legal drama, and that's not what the American public is focused on. The American public wants someone to fight for them. She's trying to make the argument that she's the best person to do that, and she's the one that comes with the least baggage, the least legal fees, realistically, coming into this race. So that's her goal, and that's her pitch to voters. All right. Olivia Rinaldi, thank you. Thank you. We will have more analysis of the ruling against Donald Trump after the break. Stay with us. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%. No doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. 
but with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Since childhood, she never stopped reaching for the skies. Now she spent more time in space than any other American. I like being a part of something bigger than me. Peggy Whitson's extraordinary career as a history-making astronaut when we go person to person. An original documentary from CBS reports. I always tell people that Twitter would not be Twitter without black Twitter. It's just us being in fellowship with each other. And it becomes a conversation you don't want to be left out of. People really started to recognize the power of activism on Twitter. Based on that one tweet, the hashtag Oscar so white was trending around the world. If anything has really powered black Twitter, it's been humor. If your food ain't right, oh, we gonna tell you about that too. So we tend to create change, create culture and cool. That's how movements happen on black Twitter and go beyond more than that. Black Twitter, the Twitterverse that changed a generation. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. A story's just begun. Why did you want to share your story? Water up this high? Where are these coming from? That's the million dollar question. I'm a very curious person. I wake up every morning asking what's happening in the world? Why is this happening? And how do we answer that question on the CBS Evening News? We continue to follow the breaking news that former President Trump and the Trump Organization has been ordered to pay $354 million in the civil fraud case. Now, there's also additional judgments that have been made against his co-defendants. The judge also banned the former president from conducting business in the state of New York over the next three years. CBS News campaign reporter and attorney Katrina Kaufman has been with me here in Studio 57 as we pour through all of this. Yeah. Katrina, looking through all of this, looking at uh, the tremendous uh, judgment uh, against the organization, uh, looking at their inability to, to be able to initiate loans from any businesses that are headquartered or based here in New York over the next three years, what does the future of the Trump Organization look like if this judgment is allowed to stand? I'm sure that Trump himself is wondering that right now. I think one thing I'd like to touch on is the issue of the potential dissolution of the company. So back in September, when Judge Ngoron first decided that Trump was liable for fraud, he also had an order to dissolve a lot of his New York empire, which then got put on pause. Um, in this opinion, he ends up saying that the independent monitor that he's putting in place to oversee the Trump organization is going to end up making a decision about this. So this is still potentially on the horizon for Donald Trump, and that would have massive consequences for him and for his business. Yes, and, you know, we understand that he has been attacking uh, and speaking out against Judge Ngoron. He's mm -hmm. also been speaking out against New York's Attorney General, Letitia James, yeah. calling them politically motivated. I understand that the Attorney General has released a statement now. She has. She says that Donald Trump is finally facing accountability for his lying, cheating, and staggering fraud, because no matter how big, rich, or pow powerful you think you are, no one is above the law. And I was also very struck by a line from Judge Ngoron's ruling as well that's in line with that. He says, the frauds found here leap off the page and shock the conscience. Shock the conscience. All right. But we're also hearing replies from the former president. Uh, he posted on social media just moments ago. He said, a crooked New York state judge working with a totally corrupt attorney general who ran on the basis of I will get Trump before knowing anything about me or my company has just fined me $355 million based on nothing other than having built a great, a great company. Election interference, witch hunt, more to follow. So as he looks forward to an appeal, mm -hmm. which he has already pledged that he is going to do, how much does that argument, because that was so much of what we heard in, in court, that this was politically motivated, mm -hmm. that this is a witch hunt. How likely is that to form the basis of this appeal? I mean, I think that he will absolutely try to claim bias, which is something he accused not just Judge Ngoron of, but also his clerk, Allison Greenfield, as well. And earlier, you and Ricky were talking about the gag order, which, you know, could potentially 
be lifted now as well, now that this ruling has been released. So I do think that the potential for bias is, is absolutely a plausible appeal for him. Is there anything else that you think is going to be the foundation for this appeal? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the, the, <laughs> one of the arguments we heard was that everybody does this and that there were no victims. Yes, exactly. I mean, I'm sure during the trial, he talked to a great extent about the state of his financial statements, about how the lenders were actually completely happy with these loans and with the terms. So I'm sure that we're really going to hear a rehashing of a lot of the arguments that we first heard in this trial. But to the appeals court, which they always thought was going to be more sympathetic to them, from day one, they've said that they were planning to appeal and that they thought they would win on an appeal. They knew they were going to lose in Judge Angoran's court. And they have, in fact, lost there. Yes. And now it goes on to an appeal. Katrina Kaufman, thank you. Before we go to break, we want to give you a live look at Mar-a-Lago. Donald Trump is expected to respond to today's circuit court ruling shortly. Once he starts speaking, we're going to take you there live. I'm Lana Zak, and you are streaming CBS News.